So I'd now like to welcome Helen Jacey. Uh, Helen is a UK screenwriter, author and story consultant and is currently co-writing a book for authors about romantic comedy as well as contributing to the forthcoming International Guide to Women Scriptwriters. Helen will be in Sydney soon for a workshop run by Screen Australia on creating female characters, a subject she's explored in depth in her book, Writing Memorable Female Characters. She's joining us via Google Hangout from London, where it is midnight, so we are incredibly grateful to you, Helen. <laughs> how are you? Hi, hi. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here at midnight. <laughs> So, Helen, I want to start off by asking you, I mean, I know that you're very familiar with all those stats. So, in all of that, with so few female characters on the screen, what about the quality of the female characters? What are the qualities we don't see in female protagonists, generally? Well, basically, I think it all revolves around different aspects of power. I think we can boil it down to pure, unadulterated power. And um, thinking about it, I came up with a little power shocking list uh, of, of these qualities. Um, and I think the first is like to do with heroism um, without any romantic love agenda. You know, giving, giving a purely heroic quality to a protagonist, you know, someone who is driven to do something great for other people without without love getting in the way or without guilt or well so basically heroism without feeling guilty um i think you know tied to that is like qualities of women saving each other or saving men i mean let's face it we uh, sort out men in everyday life so why isn't it on the big screen um we can talk more about that later maybe and then I was thinking about triumph and celebration of achievement, you know, the glorification of triumph. Um, you know, the woman who wins and loves winning and her struggle to win. And, you know, they exist in life. Uh, I'm sure the room today is full of them. But for some reason, we're, we're not giving female characters that kind of uh, power. Uh, linked to that is rage and might and maybe not so desirable, but violence and aggression. Um, and I think, you know, the true Amazons, the, those characters, those qualities about power and control, uh, using force, I think that's very, you know, we don't see that often either. Um, we're seeing it more in things like Game of Thrones, maybe, with the Daenerys character. Um, she wants power and control. It's quite interesting to see how that will spin out. Um, and then there's economic power. I mean, as the stats picked it up, we, we don't see rich female protagonists very often. Um, we don't see the rich woman giving a happy ending to her poorer lover. And again, I think that happens in life a lot more than the screen show. So, you know, thinking about a powerful woman saving her man. Um, now, so that's a kind of another big, big thing. Finally, um, it's about personal power. Um, could think about aging positively, um, aging without regret. Um, we see a lot of female biopics with older women and regret um, rather than achievement and triumph is, is focused on regret and guilt. So back to that kind of sense of quest, I think it's quite important. Um, uh, finally, I think about comradeship between women, um, female friendship without, again, the romantic subplots or without the, the rivalrous subplots. Um, you know, different versions of female friendship which are based upon respect and nurturing. Um, maybe there are subtle shifts going on, but that's another big area. So, you know, the power of solidarity, basically. Um, so that's my power, my power trip. <laughs> <laughs> So I think overall, I think you've said that when we do see female characters on the screen, they're kind of in a narrowly prescribed range of, 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 of qualities. Is that how you see it? Yeah, I just think there's these kind of omissions um, that we, about agency and drive, that uh, it's like an insidious effect that the woman is still very much the outsider in a lot of the ways we represent her, even when it's a female protagonist. And so I'm thinking about, you know, you know, what, what we've got to be seeing is basically more strength, more ego strength, more determination, um, more ambition, uh, 
um, more ambition to be something other than a lover, mother, wife, a beauty. I mean, um, linked to that, more kind of sexual desire. Um, we can learn a lot from, you know, French um, heroines that are, we don't really see them that often, um, certainly in the UK. You know, you have to look hard, but they're out there. And that kind of compulsive drives, let's say. Um, another omission, I think, is genuine charisma and humour and wit. Um, I've been watching a hell of a lot of TV recently, and I've just been thinking how charismatic male protagonists are. Um, Sherlock, The Mentalist, mm. House. I mean, Sherlock in Elementary with Lucy, with Lucy Liu being um, Watson. These men are really funny, and they're, they, they've got a kind of charisma, and we deprive the female characters of that charisma. It's quite interesting. I think what Lena Dunham is doing with girls is interesting because you see this kind of ch charisma, which is which is great. Um, so I think you know we need to have more of a healthy degree of narcissism and obsession, uh, which isn't motivated by female rivalry. Um, so I think that's something that we can we don't see enough of on screen. Um, and finally, I think kind of. Desire to protect, desire to protect not just children, not just ourselves, not just our fragile ego or ourselves in victim, but, you know, desire to protect men and what we stand for, I think, and, and our achievements. I think these, these are big omissions and these are things that we need to get on screen more. So, Helen, cinema is there. Cinema has many functions in our lives. It challenges us. It provokes us, inspires us, and it gives us pleasure. What do you think female audiences long to see in female protagonists? What would give us pleasure? Well, I mean, I think it's hard defining half the population as one audience. I think that's tricky and that's risky because, you know, what gives us pleasure is personal and it's subjective. Um, you know, soaps give a hell of a lot of women pleasure. They don't give me pleasure. I don't watch EastEnders and Coronation Street, but a lot of people derive pleasure from that. Um, a lot of Indian women derive pleasure from Bollywood. I mean, I like watching the old Bollywood film, but it's not, you know, so I think we've got to be careful because it is subjective and we can't homogenize women. Um, but we, as the stats say, we haven't stopped going to the cinema. And even though the representations are going backwards a bit, we must be deriving some pleasure. Uh, maybe we're imagining ourselves through the male gaze again and deriving pleasure through male protagonists. I don't know, that's things that we want to maybe think about. Um, but I think we're being bored, we're getting bored of being eye candy. We're being bored by, you know, defined by our looks and roles of nurturers. Um, something like Bridesmaids gave a lot of pleasure uh, to the big mainstream fem female audience. Um, and it showed the joke of being a 30, 40 something bridesmaid. And um, it showed the reality of failure, uh, the reality of feeling that inadequate. Um, so I think we want to be, we want, you know, we get pleasure from, from reality, from some things being more gritty darker, maybe more free, um, and, you know, more female solidarity, because I think Bridesmaids is really picking up on something, and I think Girls has picked up on something, that, you know, the rivalry thing is getting really too old, uh, you know, and women, you know, maybe there is some, I don't know, still some baggage from being a social minority that we, you know, residual kind of things that centuries of evolution have put on us, but at the end of the day, Women are friends to each other. We do support each other. And, you know, and I think that's got to be, we want to celebrate that in many more ways than it is that it's being done. And I think that is a big form of pleasure. You know, and we do get pleasure from the action heroines. They're here to stay. I mean, Ripley, people still talk about Ripley, but we have Salt now. We have um, Angelina in, you know, she's going to be in Maleficent coming out. Um, okay, they might be an empowered cliche, but... They are here to stay and we need them. We get pleasure from, from you know, seeing female characters who really do stick it uh, to the man. <laughs> and, so, and... <laughs> so, yeah, on the whole, um, 
you know, pleasure on the quest. That doesn't mean that we're not going to get pleasure from traditional roles that women are still fulfilling in our lives, and we are. But it's about pushing the boundaries, things that take us into a new domain, a new, new territory, things that surprise us. Yeah. So you've, you, you've focused in your book a lot on creating female characters that have a wider range of the things they're able to do and be and see and feel. Is the process of creating a female character different, do you think, from creating a male character? I don't think it is necessarily, but it can be. Um, it depends on who you are as a writer and what your creative agenda is. Um, all writers do have an ideological subtext for their stories, whether you're male or female. Um, and whether you're conscious of that or not, again, it's up to the individual. But it's going to be affected by what you think about men and women and gender. It all comes out on the page, whether whether you're aware of it or not. So with a female character, you can choose, your, you can choose to be conscious uh, and ask yourself, why am I choosing this female character? And what, what do I want her to represent? And what do I want her story to represent? And what do I want the secondary characters to represent? And the male characters. I think with a female character, you have to be more guarded to look out for the stereotypes, the acceptable cliches. Now, obviously, in a comedy, the acceptable cliches are what we're laughing at. Uh, that's where you can get away from them. That's also where you could, can subvert and like really push the boundaries. Um, so I think with women, you, female characters, you tend to want to question more the assumptions you make about characterization. Um, because just because you've seen it before on screen doesn't mean that it has to be that way with your character. I think we can really unconsciously recreate sort of perceived truths in characterization. Um, and I think it's about forcing yourself to think, actually, why am I making that decision for my character? Is that, is that right? Or am I just doing that because I don't want to shock or I want to play it safe? Or, I, you know, I'm worried about the whole likability factor, which is a massive issue as well. Um, you know, what the, this, this need that we have for character, female characters to be, you know, not push our buttons too much and about how dark they are. And... Um and what about older female protagonists? Is it better or worse for them in terms of representation on screen? Well, I, th I think it's got better. I mean, it's definitely got better on TV. I mean, we got, like, Harry Korn, Diane Lockhart. Um, you know, they're showing a future for women. OK, they're in genre procedurals in the workspace, but, they're, you know, it's more about being granny. <laughs> These are women who have... They haven't done the marriage and kids thing, and they are out there... Uh, successful, uh, okay, they might not be, well, Harry Korn is leading her series, and uh, she's a fantastic female character. She's absolutely brilliant. But with cinema, you know, older female characters, it's very genre-bound. I mean, I think Helen Mirren is only the kind of action heroine we've seen older recently. And I would like to see Charlie Theron, Halle Berry, Angelina Jolie. I'd like to see them in their 60s, in their 70s, leading action flicks, just like Bruce Willis and co are doing. And maybe they can pick up the 30-something guy as well on, on, their, on their mission. Um, but it seems far-fetched, but that shows actually a lot of narrative territory for female characters still hasn't been conquered. Um, so... Back to the genre-bound nature of cinema, you know, Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, Late Quartet, again, they're, they are positioning females in the family, but why not? What's wrong with that? But, you know, the great thing about Best Exotic was it showed, OK, it was focusing on life and death and coming to terms with your life, which I'm sure a lot of the older audience does want, um, and, you know... Comedies and dramedies and dramas are good for that. But at the end of the day, it, it did show hope and it showed new life and it showed sexual passion, which I, I think, you know, it's, I think it's getting better. But when people say to me, older female characters, I think two things. I think Gran Torino and I think the bucket list. And I think if Gran Torino had a female character... Uh, this is the Clint Eastwood film about the old grouch who befriends the neighbours or doesn't befriend the neighbours, does eventually. You know, 
I'd like to see a female character in that kind of film, and I'd like to see a bucket list. I'd like to see two old women going off pursuing their agendas, having pleasure, not about coming to terms with regret, failure, their roles as women, as mothers, as grandmothers. Um, so, you know, the older woman, she, she's got a long way to go, but she is getting there. So, Helen, in, in, the, in the course of building up your body of work and study on female protagonists, you have also developed concerns about representation of men on screen, ironically. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think... Um, <laughs> I, I feel quite sorry for male characters because I think they have, like... They, they're really quite limited. Um, even though they can be more charismatic and witty, I also think they're... Um, they are kind of endangered by male pride in a way that the writers, the producers, the directors are not letting male characters be vulnerable. Um, and I think everyone's making excuses for male characters. Um, they have so far to go as nurturers, as sharers, as carers. I mean, men in real life are assuming those roles, but for somehow it's not... Um, it's not getting on screen. Um, was, was, um, and men are very, very stereotypical. Um, and I think men need to be asking these questions if, if they will. Uh, and women certainly should be asking male characters, the ones they're creating, you know, what kind of um, roles and, uh, uh, and sensibilities they're giving men. But, you know, we, we, we're kind of oversaturated by the tough guy and what all that means. And I think, I think the tough guy's really got to be, you know, pulled down off his pedestal and given a bit more vulnerability. I mean, why was Sideways such a big hit? Because it showed that vulnerability. You know, Miles and Sideways, he was on, if you like, a heroine's journey. It was about coming to terms with his identity, his hurt, his feelings. His, his inner truth. We see females on those, on those kinds of journeys all the time. And I think, you know, even though we have the rise of the bromance, we have the rise of the bromedy, which is kind of showing new forms of emotional literacy, I guess. Um, stereotypical images of women are still persisting in, in these genres. So um, that's, that, these are issues for, for us to think about. Mm. And so, Helen, do you see any structural obstacles in the industry which are preventing change in these areas? Well, you know, I mean, when I wrote my, when I wrote my book, there wasn't one. So 15 years of, like, how-to guides, no one had talked about female characters. It was all... There's assumptions on universalism. So I think that is one big sort of structural obstacle is how we think that, you know, we don't have to think about gender... Um, but I know, I know things like today and all the statistics and all the research are really shifting the energy in a new direction. Um, but I think one of the kind of spin-offs that needs to happen is screenwriting training and storytelling education for filmmakers in general. Um, you know, we need to teach gender on, on our filmmaking courses. Um, knowledge is power. We need, you know, people are, are film... TV, media, they're such powerful tools. And we need to educate people in how much power their stories have and how much power their representations are going to have in influencing audiences. Um, so I think that's my... I think there are lots of different structural things, and I'm sure the other members of the panel are going to be more attuned to talking to that. But I insist, you know, I run an MA here in the UK and I, you know, I make, I make my students look at gender. <laughs> um, they come out all quite aware by the end of it. And do you have any so, thoughts on... We want to focus today on... We want to, we want to put a name to any structural obstacles in the industry that we can all work to change. But we also want to put the spotlight and task ourselves with things that women themselves can do about this. So is there anything that you think that women themselves can do to improve the situation? Well, I think it's very hard for women because we still are, you know, it's very really hard to shift away from our identity as feeling responsible for other people and caring. And I think that can really get in the way of being an artist and achiever. Um, 
we're still programmed from day one to look after other people and we're still breaking free but we don't know it and i think that confuses women so i think you know we all live with a kind of sense of guilt inner guilt inner outsider syndrome um and i think a misplaced sense of responsibility to other people is always going to get in the way of your achievement and i think it's really really hard for women i mean it's hard for me and i i consider myself an empowered feminist but i still find myself you know self sabotaging at times putting other well everyone wants to be important but i think for women it is it's difficult it's a difficult negotiation but it's about being strong and true to your inner artist you know if you're not no one else is going to be